Well, just to get a red light. All right. Um, well, thank you guys so much for coming in. Uh, I hope you are enjoying the summit thus far and have had a good morning. Uh, the session is the one thing between you and lunch. So um, <laughs> hopefully it'll be worth your while. Um, today what we're going to talk about is structured data and the SEO magic that you can create with it. To kick things off, I have my magical transition slide. Are you ready? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> right? Should we do it one more time? We can do it one more time. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Don't worry, that is the only time in this presentation that you will have to deal with that. Um, <laughs> I know. Was it? Good. It's just, we just keep building the magic. It's going to be great. Um, first, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Catherine White. Um, I am a longtime Austinite in here from Austin, Texas. This is my first time to Portland. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, had amazing Thai food last night. It's a beautiful city. So, um, yeah, excited to be up in this part of the country. Uh, my background, I am a solution architect and an engineer. Uh, I started working with Drupal about 10 years ago. Um, my first build was in 5, D5, D6. Uh, and um, I am very much, it, from an architecture perspective, I am that person that loves to put things in things. I am an organized soul, I have a database background, I cannot go in a container store. Uh, so that's why this particular topic of structured data and the organization of information is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I am also the director of engineering at Canopy Studios, uh, working with Anne Stefanik and these lovely folks here up front, um, where we do uh, both builds and support in both Drupal and WordPress. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, what we're going to talk about today is structured data. What the heck is it? Why do we care? What, why do we use it? Uh, what kind of formats are available for the implementation of structured data, and then what the current options look like in Drupal 8 um, for getting those on your site, with kind of a focus on the site building perspective here. Uh, so what is structured data? First of all, who, how many folks in the room are already familiar with structured data? Okay, a few people, great. Um, we're gonna take this at a pretty high level, um, but definitely if you have more detailed questions, I welcome them at the end. At the end. Um, at the highest level, structured data is meta information about your, your content. So another show of hands, who's familiar with, I mean, meta tags? Yes, okay, great. So structured data is, uh, it builds on meta tags and it is basically just a way to add additional information about a piece of content in your page. Now this can be about the contents of the page overall or it can be some very specific small snippet, say, that features your contact information. So there are different scopes for this kind of information, but what you're doing is providing greater detail about a piece of content on the site. These are highly semantic constructs. Uh, they are repeatable and they're machine oriented. So it feels very much when you're, when you're working with structured data, it's gonna feel a lot like filling out a form. Uh, this is my name. This is my address. This is my phone number. Effectively, what a form does is guides us through structured input, which is what structured data is. It's very core to the concept of the semantic web, uh, which, uh, which strives to create relationships and meaning uh, between all pieces of content that are on the web. Um, and so what we do to do that is create these uh, defined repeatable structures that can be applied to any website and help us see who's sharing the same types of content. Um, to that point, it relates, so it relates the content kind of categorically. So we understand that your site and your site and your site, everybody's serving recipes. Okay, great. Uh, they all are gonna share certain things in common. Um, so it gives us the standardized formats to get that apples to apples comparison across our sites. Sounds cool, sounds kind of crunchy. Why do we care? Why do we use it? Well, when all is said and done, the reason we use it is because search engines love it. Uh, why? Well, because search engines are machines and this is a very machine oriented sort of structure. Um, the biggest thing to know about is, so schema.org, which is the source of all of the schema that we're gonna talk about today, was actually founded by um, search engine companies, uh, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Yandex, who are looking for ways to be able to crawl and understand the architecture of information so that they could better relate content when they provide search results. Since it's repeatable, and if everybody's using the same format, this gives them the power to do that. 
um, makes it easy for them to understand and weight content. That being said, so structured data, as we dive into schema.org, you're going to see there is a proliferation of definitions out there. Uh, and they're not all created equal, is the reality. So when we're dealing with search engines, it's important to know that when you first start diving into this, it can feel really overwhelming. And it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole trying to mark up every single thing that exists on your site, which is probably not necessary. So what I wanted to call out here is there are certain types of content where this is important from a search engine perspective. And then there are types where it's just, it's a nice to have, it's certainly never gonna hurt. But at least right now, it's not a focus. So uh, the things that are, um, a focus pretty universally across search engines right now are your corporate contact information, uh, your creative works, so things like your, bro your blog articles and recipes that you may be presenting, or um, music and movies. Um, their structured data is really, really helpful for local results. So if you are running a business with multiple physical locations and you're trying to target, target certain geographic re regions, marking, marking up your content with that in mind. Um, Products, obviously, and the ability to do product comparisons uh, within Google um, are, are, is driven by this data. Uh, and of course, reviews. We've all seen five-star ratings that appear in listing with, you know, in, in line with our search result listings, right? Um, job postings, courses, uh, and events are another area where providing this information for search engines to ingest will give an enhanced experience of your content. Uh, when people are looking around the web for information. Um, so that's neat. How do search engines actually use this information? So we provide it and they read it and that's great. And it helps that they understand kind of how to relate content across the web um, structurally uh, to one another. But what do they actually do with that information once they have it? Um, I thought it'd be fun to kind of do some show and tell. Some of these are going to be things that you've probably seen in your own traversals across the internet, but you may not know how they were done or why a particular site gets that treatment and maybe yours doesn't. Um, featured placement is a big one. So a lot of the times, and I, I'm going to use Google for most of my examples because that's the search engine I have the most experience with. Um, so that's what we're going to look at up here. But uh, this applies pretty universally. Um, featured placement is one of those things where you will see search engines with richer re uh, search results with richer rendering at the top of a search re search results page, right? You'll see thumbnails and you'll see ratings information or time to cook or whatever it is or a breadcrumb trail. Um, that kind of featured placement, on average, you'll see that about 36% um, of search results in Google not, are, are not necessarily being featured placement. But 36% of the average result set that you see are sites that are using structured data. That being said, as of 2014, which was the most recent um, evaluation of this that I could find, so my assumption is the traction is probably not exponential, um, but as of 2014, only about 0.3% of sites actually have this implemented. So those 0.3% of sites are accounting for 36% of the results that you're seeing. So that's kind of the power of structured data, and that's why from a getting your brand out and your messaging and your products out, it's a definite competitive edge when it comes to SEO. So what does featured placement look like when I say that? You know, what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about those enhanced search result listings. Um, if you are looking especially on your mobile devices at search results, uh, you'll see carousels of results. Um, also, what we're going to look at an example of, but the knowledge panel that Google provides, which is on that right-hand sidebar that has information about, you know, an organization or a concept or a band or what have you. Uh, and then these immersive search experiences, which you may or may not have stumbled across, but I think are really cool, that are interesting tools that um, Google at least is trying to provide within the search context, um, which ends up being a way that users are interacting with your brand before they ever get to your site. So enhanced results. Enhanced results are the things we've been talking about. Uh, and I love to cook, so we're mostly going to be looking at pictures of vegetables. <laughs> but, um, you know, so you've got the five-star ratings, you've got the calorie count, you've got how much time it takes to cook these things, uh, you've got beautiful thumbnail imagery, 
All of that detailed information is the result of structured data. This is the knowledge panel that I referred to earlier, and this is probably something you've seen before. Uh, Google's knowledge graph, or knowledge panels that they provide. Again, it's the contact and social information that represents an organization. It includes their logo. Uh, it can provide contact information, phone number to reach out. All of this is the result of structured data. Mobile carousels. So if you've got an aggregate of articles on your site, you will sometimes see that um, search result listings on Google will render a carousel of results from the same site. Or in some cases, you know, they'll, they'll render a carousel of news articles that may be from multiple sources, depending on what your search looks like. Uh, and again, the ability to have these grouped results is also a product of structured data. So by providing the additional meaning, yeah? Can you get those carousels without using Google AI? Um, Google really loves structured data in conjunction with AMP. Um, and so when you're looking at their mobile search results, I think, I don't know for sure, okay. but they are always going to favor AMP results over non-AMP results. So best, your, your, your best opportunity is going to be to combine them. Uh, because yes, Google is pushing AMP very, very hard. Uh, and it is definitely the way to boost your mobile SEO with them. Um, AMP stands for? AMP stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages. So this is a, um, an approach to web page development that is leaner and designed for performance and caters specifically to mobile devices. Um, it's an initiative that Google's been leading. So. And then you've got these kind of cool immersive search experiences, which, you know, I always feel like I've stumbled on some like really cool hidden Easter egg, if you will, when I find them. So I wanted to share a couple because I think they're really neat. But the thing to note about these is, so this example is job listings. Uh, the thing to note about these is these types of experiences where somebody can go in and peruse job listings in their area and having your career openings show up in these kinds of listings means that these users are highly qualified before they ever look at your site, before they ever engage in your content, with your content in a non-search context. So providing this kind of structured content um, is an opportunity for users to have, in, the, in that awareness phase of the life cycle, um, to have more interaction with your brand than they would have otherwise. And this is another example of this, um, which is more product focused, but for example, with albums and track listings. So artists and albums that are marked up using structured data provide these really rich experiences that enable you to peruse the album right here within the search context and see other recordings of it, see videos, and also see product listings. So again, by the time somebody reaches your site with intent to purchase, they've done a lot of research through the search context already. So this sounds really cool, right? How do we do this? The way we do it is with schemas. Schemas are the way that we define things. And I'm using things with a thing with a capital T because actually schema.org uses thing with a capital T, which makes me ridiculously happy. Um, <laughs> And to segue into that, we're going to have a quick vocabulary lesson. It's a really nerdy joke. But <laughs> my point here is that uh, schema.org itself, when we start talking about schema and the way that structured data is organized, schema.org itself is a vocabulary. A vocabulary is a collection of schema. Uh, a schema is then going to hierarchically be made up of things. So everything is a thing, but then you'll have a type of a thing. So the example here is I've got things. One type of thing is a creative work. Okay, so that'll be our, our item uh, or a type. And then a creative work will have, I've got this a little bit. So you've got your schema, which is, you, which is a thing. And then you'll have an item underneath that, which is a creative work. 
And then underneath that, you'll have, say, a, um, an article, for example, which is a type. And then the article will have properties that are specific to it. So articles have publication dates, and they have authors, and they have other things that are standard features of writing an article. And this can start to feel a lot like building a content type, right? Um, so the properties will provide a wide definition of, of snippets of information about this particular item, all right? And these properties are also hierarchical. So we talk about things, and then we've got creative works, and then we've got articles. Well, things have properties, and creative works have properties, and articles have properties, and they all inherit. So an article gets all the stuff that a thing has and all the stuff that a creative work has. And then it has its own special things that go along with that. Uh, another thing to know is that schemas are not, don't have to be independent. So you can interlink, interlink objects, and you can also nest objects within one another. So for example, it's kind of a shoddy example, but if you have an article and you've got an author, say you've got an author box, and that author box provides a lot of rich context about that person. Well, a person is another schema. And so you can nest that information within your article context. You can see where the rabbit hole starts to come in with all of this. Um, so schema, conceptually, this is how they're defined. But the implementation of them, there's actually a few different ways that you can approach it. So we're going to talk through some data formats, which are all valid ways of approaching the implementation of <laughs> schema information on your site. This is schema.org. It's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> totally easy to figure out and usable. Look, this is a, a recipe, for example, in the context of schema.org. I actually was talking to someone about this um, back in December, and they were like, oh, I have seen that site, but it looks so old and out of date that I assumed it wasn't relevant <laughs> to anything. Um, so the beauty, is, <laughs> the beauty is in the architecture, not so much the visuals. Uh, but this is an example of the property inheritance that I was talking about. So you can see here, uh, we've got a thing, we've got a creative work, we've got a how-to, which is a type of creative work, and then there's a recipe that lives under how-to. All right? Um, up top, you'll see we've got the properties from recipes. So these are things that are really, really specific to the recipe context. But then under there, you'll see there are properties from how-to, like prep time. So if you give instructions on how to build a farmhouse table or you give instructions on how to roast vegetables, both of those are going to have prep time involved. It just looks different. So that's why it's this hierarchical structure. So I mentioned structured data formats. And this is the, this is the how. This is how we start to get structured data implemented in the context of our websites and our pages. There are three main types, for all intents and purposes, of uh, structured data formats that are in play. Uh, the first one and the granddaddy is microdata. Microdata is the format that schema.org originally used. Um, it is an HTML specification, so it's attribute based. So when you're writing out your HTML tags, there are literally additional um, attributes that you will add into the markup um, to add schema definitions to your content. Um, and so because of that context, it feels pretty familiar uh, if you've never messed with this before and you just want to experiment with it, microdata can be a good place to start. This is an example of microdata-driven markup uh, for an article. So you'll see up at the top we talk about this is an item, so it's got item scope and it's a type of schema article. And then you'll start seeing all of these item properties <coughs> that we're dropping in. And some of them have additional scopes, like, uh, it's, it's cut off here, but for example, the social network would be an additional item scope that is within the scope of the article, okay? Um, and then we go down and you have meta tags that you're also adding into the markup um, for content that you may not be necessarily displaying, but that's still relevant to the schema, okay? So that's, that's microdata. The next one to talk about is RDFA. Now, there is an RDFA module in core in Drupal 8, 
Uh, I'm not really going to focus on that for purposes of this talk, but I do want to call it out because it is an option to kind of get involved with RDFA on your site out of the box. Um, RDFA, and because I'm a big believer in defining acronyms, is Resource Description Framework in Attributes. So this is another attribute-based approach to schema markup implementation on your site, but it's a little bit more XML flavored. Um, so it will work with XML, it work with HTML. Um, it is a, an extension of HTML5. Uh, and uh, as you saw, those, those nested item scope things are a little kludgy. Um, I, I, I find that RDFA can be a little bit easier if you are going to be nesting schemas. Um, it can be easier to manage. It's a personal opinion. But, um, so here is a, an example of article done in RDFA. So now we're defining our vocabulary, which is schema.org. So we start at the top. Um, and then we, go, we get into this type of article. And we've got, again, property equals name, property equals author. It's a little bit easier to read. Um, but because of the way item scope is declared at the top, it can be a little bit easier to manage those nested scenarios. Um, so these are both very markup-based approaches to implementing structured data. Um, and there are some considerations that go along with that. You know, one is that it's nice because it's a package deal, right? Where you have your content in the page is where you do all of your definition about that content. So uh, there's no redundancy with this, and you know it's easy to. F there's there's no uh, there's also no separation of the data, so you're not digging around for where this schema is uh, defined outside the context of the content that it is defining. Um, but on the, on the downside of it, and, and again, it's that, it's that attribute-based markup that, that's familiar to us. It's something we've seen before. We're like, okay, I get this HTML attributes. No problem. We've got that. But it's also not the easiest thing to read, right, to actually go through and figure out how these schema are architected and have I filled in all the blanks. Going through and threading through all of your properties and all of your meta tags and making sure that everything's in there is not, not, uh, it's not as efficient as it could be. For, for people. Which brings us to JSON-LD. Um, JSON-LD is the newest player in terms of uh, these, these data formats. Uh, JSON-LD, given my definitions, is JavaScript object notation for linked data. So it's a JavaScript object. It gets injected into the document just like any other JavaScript object would. So it can go in the head of your document, it can go in the body of your document. If you're working with JavaScript applications, it'll still work. Uh, and because it's an object, it's a little bit easier to read um, in terms of, again, going through that outline of the properties that you've defined. Um, the, one of the big things to note with JSON-LD is most of the search engines um, this is the direction they're going. Google highly, highly recommends using this approach. They support microdata and RDFA, but JSON-LD is their favorite. Um, on the downside, it decouples your definition from the content that it's defining, and you end up duplicating your content to a certain extent because you're filling in the blanks in the JavaScript object, and you're also printing that content on the page. Depending on how tidy you are, that might drive you crazy. It might not matter at all. Um, but it's just something to consider. So this is an example of what JSON-LD looks like, which is really different from the examples that we've looked at before, right? So this is JavaScript object notation. Um, again, we're giving context and type. And then when we need to insert a nested schema, like an interaction statistic, it's super clean and easy to read. Okay, cool. So we understand the basic concept of items and their properties and their types, and we've looked at a couple of different ways to implement them. They're pretty crunchy and pretty detail-oriented, obviously, this kind of, of definition of your information. So you know, how do we know if we've actually done this correctly? It seems like there's a lot of room for error, and there is. But the good news is that Google has the answer. Um, or at least it has some tools to help. So one caveat I want to give up front is that 
interestingly, every search engine is a special snowflake. We all know that, right? And schema.org has these very structured hierarchical definitions of objects and things and items and properties, and it will declare in those definitions what properties are required, what properties are not. Um, Google and schema.org don't always see eye to eye on that. So schema.org may tell you you have to have something that Google doesn't care about. And vice versa, Google may tell you you have to have something that schema.org says is optional. So I just want to call it out because while I find the uh, Google testing tools to be the easiest ones to use, um, they're not necessarily validating according to exactly what schema.org is telling you. So that can get a little confusing. But this is an example of their structured data testing tool. Uh, and I've got links in these slides and the slides will be online following the presentation. Um, but what you'll see here is markup, uh, you, can, you can import your markup on the left and it'll show you on the right all of the um, schema.org properties that it was able to determine based on the markup you gave it. Now what you're actually looking at here, um, just as a point of trivia, is the raw output with um, develop content in an article using the RDFA module that comes in core. So this is the out-of-the-box implementation for D8. But what you'll see is um, we've, we've, it's figured out our type. We've got our permalink, great. Um, name, how many comments, date, summary, et cetera. So it's identifying the content that we've marked up using RDFA out of the box D8. So the great thing about this is it tells you if you've got errors. It tells you if you've got warnings. It gives you the opportunity. Some of, sometimes you'll get false, um, false errors here. So, um, and again, sometimes what it says is required is not what schema says is required. It can be a little bit confusing, but use your best judgment. Um, and if Google is your focus, then getting as clean as you can um, using their structured data testing tool uh, will, will hold you in good stead. Microdata, RDFA, JSON-LD, Seems like a lot of work to do all three. So what do we do? What format should we use? Uh, does it matter? Ultimately, as I said at the beginning, all of these are valid formats. Search engines will read any of them. So it's a question of your organization, your comfort level, um, you know, what works best for you. If you were gonna ask me for a recommendation, um, ultimately I would say if you're in doubt, start with JSON-LD. Um, the caveat to that is Bing. Nice snowflake. Um, right now, Bing does not officially support JSON-LD. Uh, they are experimenting with it. We're seeing it now for, they, they, so they've got some unofficial support for like recipes. Um, but they are, they have been a little bit slower to adopt it than all the other search engines. So there are folks, um, especially who work with um, JSON-LD, uh, in the Drupal context, who will implement redundant RDFA and JSON-LD to ensure that they're maximizing the potential across all the search engines. I would say that really depends on, I would encourage you, you know, if, you're, if you're debating, take a look at your analytics. Um, you know, where are users coming in on your site from so that you can focus your efforts when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, if, if Bing is a big consideration for you, JSON-LD alone might not be the right choice at this point in time. So let's talk about structured data in Drupal 8. Um, I mentioned the, the core RDFA module. We looked at some of the output from that. Um, that's a great thing to just turn on and, uh, and play with. Um, for me at least, I was, as you saw, I was having some validation issues out of the box. Um, I didn't dive super deep into why, um, but uh, extending the uh, RDFA implementation in core is going to ultimately require um, some custom coding, some custom module work. So it's a question of whether you want a turnkey site building solution or whether you really want to dig in and, um, and get involved with that. But that is out there, uh, and like I said, it's part of core, so it's a great option for just getting started. Um, that being said, uh, the number one thing I would say is regardless of the method that you use to do this implementation, 
provide metadata on your site. <laughs> it's one of the most important things you can do outside of keeping your markup structured and semantic and clean. It's one of the biggest things that you can do for the findability and shareability of your site. And when we talk about metadata, that's everything from you know, your, our classic meta tags, like our meta descriptions and our meta titles, right? Um, all the way to this kind of stuff. Um, and likewise, the kind of open graph and other types of metadata that you apply for social sharing. Um, so how to get super cool Twitter cards and things like that. So use it is the number one thing. Um, the module I wanted to highlight for you guys and make sure you're aware of is uh, the schema.org meta tag module. So this is an initiative that's relatively new. It's picked up a lot of traction. I'm very excited about it. Um, they are actually gunning hard towards a 1.0 release, um, which is very exciting. Um, the schema.org meta tag module builds on top of and extends meta tag. And the same folks who are involved in meta tag have also been instrumental in getting us to 1.0 in schema.org meta tag. Um, with the addition of, of, of Karen and folks, there's, there's so many people involved. Um, this will provide schema.org schema types for a subset of the schema that schema.org provides. Now, schema.org actually has, I think, over 700 schema that are defined. So the idea that we're going to have a submodule for every single one of those is probably not realistic. Um, in fact, I'd say I'm pretty certain it's not realistic, but uh, it does provide um, submodules for some of the most common uh, schema that are in use. Um, and it gives you the architecture to extend the type of things that are available if what you need doesn't come out of the box. Uh, and they do provide examples on how to get, how to, how to get started with doing that. Um, so right now, uh, schema.org meta tag supports um, these types straight out of the box. These will all load as submodules when you install it. You can turn on what you need. And you, assign, you, know, you assign your meta tag field to your content type, and you're off to the races. Um, and that's going to be the stuff that we probably see the most consistently, right? Articles, organizations, people, events, products. Um, I didn't really get into things like website and web page, but those are like meta, meta schema. They're talking about the entire page context as opposed to your article content or your corporate contact information or what have you. Um, it provides an item list for your views and a uh, breadcrumb list, which... I didn't touch on it in my examples, but you may have noticed sometimes when you're running search results on Google, um, you'll see the title of the page and you'll actually see sort of a, a breadcrumb navigation structure that explains to you exactly where it lives in the context of that site. Um, you know, it's one of the things that as, from a, from a pure UX perspective, we always struggle with, right, is you never know what page a user is going to land on your site, uh, where they're going to come in from. You know, it can be dangerous to assume they're coming in the front door. So being able to provide some additional context about what's out there on your site before they ever click on the link can be helpful to orienting the users once they actually get to your site. One of the great things about you know, this approach um, uh, and, and structured data in general, I think, and the way search engines are using it, is it really does um, enhance, enhance the user experience of interacting with your brand even though there's nothing about it that the user, the user actually sees or knows anything about. So it's not about the sexy design or the IA, um, but it gives them opportunities to have a deeper understanding of what you're offering um, and a positive experience with your brand outside of your site context. So those are the supported schema out of the box with schema.org meta tag. Um, things that are currently in the works uh, that they're in the process of trying to get to an MVP, MVP patch for are aggregate ratings, which are a part of a number of different schema. Um, so it's kind of a building block. Um, also reviews uh, and recipes. And like I said before, they provide some examples for how to build these uh, yourself. So if there's a type that they're not representing that you need or there's something that you think would be great for the core module, go ahead and get involved um, and start working on, on building them out. So, but this is, this is kind of what's in the works. Um, I'm not sure how much of this will be in the actual 1.0 release, um, but these should be following pretty shortly thereafter. Uh, and their issue queue, of course, is out there if you want to kind of get up to speed on what's going on. The other thing I will say in general about this 
activity is if you're a data nerd like me, this is fun. For a lot of people, this is painful. So what I want to say is you get out of it what you put into it. No amount of structured data is bad. Like anything is better than nothing. Um, the more specific you can get, the better, the, the better results you're going to see. Um, but that being said, none of it's a guarantee, right? I can't stand up here and tell you that if you put structured data on your website, you're going to pop to the top of Google and everything's going to be amazing and flowers and sunshine. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely not going to hurt. But it is time consuming to implement and it can be time consuming to figure out exactly what it is that your site needs to be effective in this context. So you'll get out of it what you put into it. Um, the great things about about the great thing about solutions like MetaTag and Schema.org, MetaTag is you're able to tokenize a lot of this information, um, and you can have a virtually turnkey solution that gets you a, a pretty good chunk of the way there. Um, and that's really what I had. So we talked a little bit about what structured data is um, and how it benefits your site in an SEO context and also in a user experience context. Um, and uh, kind of the formats that are available for implementation and then talking through a couple of the options that are available out there right now for, for D8. Um, I have a bunch of resource links. Um, Google provides a really lovely intro to structured data, so if you want to do some more reading on your own about this topic, uh, that's a great place to start. Uh, I've also got linked out here a JSON LD Playground, which gives you the ability to start to write that markup and kind of see what it would do. Um, the structured data testing tool that we talked about, um, the meta tag module, and then the, the, the giant laundry list of the full set schema that are available on schema.org. So all of that will be in my slides, which will be up online following the presentation. Um, and that's it. I would, we've got plenty of time here for questions, so I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Um, if you're not into the standing up and talking, you're welcome to email me or hit me up on Twitter, um, and I'd love to discuss it further. So that's all I've got. Thanks so much. Does the schema module write a JSON type file or does it just wrap the markup? Uh, it basically, it hijacks what's happening in, um, it hijacks what's happening in MetaTag and ends up wrapping it in a JSON object. So it's not doing any markup injection. Okay, so it does it create a JSON LD file or it uh, no, it just creates. So when you create JSON LD, um, you're kind of you're declaring your, your, the the type that it's JSON LD at the top of the object, and so it's just going to take that object definition and insert it. I think it's I don't remember exactly where in the page it inserts it, but so it will take all of the metadata um, that would be auto generated using um, the meta tags module and instead convert it to a JavaScript object that it injects into the page. Cool. I will have a link on my Twitter account, um, and then I'm pretty sure, I'm not positive if there's a place I can upload the slides to the uh, PNW site, um, but if I can, I'll stick it there as well. Oh. Um, we talked a little bit more about implementing the AMP stuff. Is that best to use the AMP module to do that? Like, or is it just kind of all the same thing? Um, it's not all the same thing. The AMP module is a great place to start. So basically, AMP ends up being, it sits in parallel right. with your main page. Um, and it's, it's developed according to kind of a separate set of standards in terms of what's loading at the top of the page and how lean the markup is. Um, so where, where these come into play together is that when you're doing a mobile search on Google, um, Google will always favor AMP pages, and then AMP pages that implement structured data are going to get bumped even higher and provide those rich like swipe carousels and those kinds of search results that you're seeing in mobile. So um, AMP is another huge push, and I would say if SEO is a focus for you, definitely look at doing um, an accelerated mobile pages implementation as well. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned if there's not a schema type that we're interested in or has been developed to get involved. Yeah. Have you done that? I have not personally. I've been following all of this really closely, but for the most part, what they've got available out of the box has met my needs, and I haven't delved into um, into being a part of the, the development on the module. I really, I would really love to. It just hasn't worked but out time-wise. That would happen on schema.org? Uh, no. So 
when I when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about um, the schema.org meta tag module specifically. So if there's a schema definition on schema.org that you need that isn't already provided, getting in there and building a sub module to provide it would be fantastic. Um, suggestions for schema.org, I don't I don't have any clue how that works. I mean, I know that it is kind of community territory. Yeah. Um, and they have some information on their site about the community and they, they probably have some getting involved uh, information there, but I actually am not, I'm not up on that. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, I was looking at this module actually, I came across it a couple weeks ago, I do a Drupal module a day and I'm like, oh, I remember this one, I tweeted about this one. Um, and I was just looking at the picture, it looks like it's got fields that are kind of, oh, what's the word, Is token the right word? I'm not deaf. But I know with like meta tags, there's defaults. Mm -hmm. If you don't change it, there's some default. Exactly. This, this also has its defaults as well. Yeah, it leverages the same thing. So just like you could set your defaults using tokens in MetaTag, you can set defaults using tokens for schema.org. So and then you can override them on a per node basis if you want to. Because I do some of both, and I know it's very tedious when you have to manually update, and it depends on how good your content is. Yeah, I always am in favor of giving intelligent tokenized defaults and then customizing only where you need to. Right, like your landing pages. Yeah, pages. yeah. Yeah, okay, good. I'll take a look at it. Cool, great. And I'm very much standing on the shoulders of giants here, so uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that has gone into this stuff, and I think it's super cool, so hopefully um, hopefully it will work out for you as well. Other questions? Could you back up to the, the page before this one, if possible? And if you want, you can also leave your email address and we can mail you or email you the slides. Yeah, happy to do that as well. Not a problem. It's on Twitter as well. It is now. Oh, awesome. Um, but one thing about that on Twitter is you can't click the links because when you click in that, whatever the slide uploader is, it flips the next slide. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, could. So I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. I, mean, I just Googled those cool. things by, you know, <laughs> Jason LD Playground goes right to it. So. Okay. Great. Well, that, thank you for that feedback. I thought you could click on those. I will. Uh, I could. I will put them. I will either either add links into the session description so that they're available outside the slide context, or find another way to post those slides and update. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, not a question. Just a, I noticed I went to look up Jason LD, and, and it's a standard that started back in 2010. WC3, so it's taking a little while to percolate. It's very interesting, um, and and I've had a couple of discussions uh, with folks about this. So. Structured data has been around a long time, <laughs> a really long time. Um, but it's only been in the last, you know, you know, probably 2012, 2014 to now that it's really started to gain traction. And I think it's part of that is because as search has become so much more critically important um, and there's so much more noise that finding ways to you know, rise above the noise becomes increasingly important. I've also been told, but haven't verified, that um, a lot of the structured data technology had more traction overseas than it did in the U.S. for a while, um, and that part of that is that we're we're, we're just now kind of catching up with it. Um, I don't know how true that is. I have not fact checked that particular discussion point. So, if somebody wants to fact check it, let me know. That'd be awesome. I also think this has interesting implications for how we build content types. Um, just as food for thought, like are there ways that we can leverage uh, schema.org schema definitions in the way that we architect our content types to make this stuff easier? And from a purist content strategy perspective, moving forward to give us the most flexibility across different platforms. Yeah? This is probably a naive question, but um, is there a way to integrate taxonomy tags that you would have to block those? That is a good question. Because, <coughs> like, we, if we write a blog, if I write a blog post, I usually add a tag to it to, so that I can put it into some kind of word cloud and search for it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> if that automatically went into the schema. Um, I would have to dig and see if that's something that's being done currently. I. I am fairly confident that related topics must be something that can be, uh, and again, this may be a naive answer. Um, the related topics are something that should be a, should be a core definition 
Um, but I'd have to look into it, honestly. One of the things about schema.org is the reality is I will never know everything because there's like 785 of these things and the way they relate to each other is kind of crazy. Um, but I would be surprised if there's not a way to incorporate that into this structure. You could probably field the taxonomy term put fields on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it would probably work. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. So I'm brand new to Google, like haven't even built a real site yet. Yay, welcome. <laughs> and I just have a question. Would you say that it's better to look for the modules through Google or to go with one of the other schemas that you've talked about? So the module provides um, what is effectively a turnkey solution. And if you're just getting started with Drupal, my recommendation would be to take a look at, um, start working with it from a site building perspective first and see what's out there and really get acquainted with kind of the, 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 the don't leave home without it list of modules that are out there that are widely adopted that provide certain types of functionality just to get used to it rather than um, it's, awesome, it's awesome to dive in and I would love for you to do that, but I also want you to get frustrated out the gate. So my recommendation would be maybe starting with more of that site building perspective and as you gain confidence in the system, then getting involved with um, writing your own modules that extend that functionality or doing your own theming uh, and extending themes to give you what you're looking for. But I think um, as an exercise in getting to know Drupal, taking the module route up front is probably a good idea. We'll leave a little piece of paper up front if you do want to get this email and not chase links. Yeah, I'm happy to email it out. Um, like I said, I I, uh, I I nerd out about data architecture, so if anybody else just wants to send me an email and talk about that, <laughs> it would totally make my day. <laughs> Other questions, comments? All right, well, then I guess you get to be first in line for lunch. Woo. Thank you.